And yet, I want to remind you that over the past year, since we began our active programs, since we began to use in earnest the tools that I just articulated, and since at the beginning there was a great expression of angst that we would have severe consequences of a depreciating dollar and so on, since we began those programs over the last year, the dollar has appreciated 17% against the euro and 29% against the British pound. Um, and the only currency, major currency, at which it has not appreciated is the Japanese yen against which it is flat over that period. I want to give you some numbers to contemplate, since I had them calculated this morning, uh, just to make double sure. Uh, from a Hong Kong investor's perspective, let me just give you some numbers to put things in perspective. If a Hong Kong investor had purchased a three-month U.S. Treasury bill in March of 2008 and rolled it over every three months until the end of this past month, the return would have been scant, 0.6%. But if that investor had bought euro area central government three months and roll, rolled them over, he would have lost 14.4%. Um, and if you had just, uh, say, uh, kept it uh, local, say bought Singapore government bonds or whatever, the return would have been 0.48%. And in Japanese yen, uh, not much more than what you earned uh, in, in terms of the weak return earned on the dollar. If you had gone out for 10 years, the one-year return in Hong Kong dollars for investing in a 10-year Hong Kong government note would have been 8.9%. Pretty good money. If you had invested in euro notes, minus 9.7%. If you had invested in a 10-year U.S. Treasury, 11.8% positive. My point is that, uh, at least thus far, these great concerns of anxiety and angst that we heard um, certainly didn't take grip. And if I may paraphrase one of my favorite quotes, and I don't want to insult any of the brunettes in the audience, but Andrew Mellon was right. Gentlemen prefer bonds, American bonds. <coughs> but this is the past. And as to the future, Nancy asked me to tell that joke, by the way. She's the blonde sitting in the back. Uh, uh, that's the past. As to the future, the underlying math becomes much more complicated. The net new supply of Treasury debt is predicted to expand in the fiscal year 2009, in which we are six months into it, by $2.5 trillion versus $788 billion the last fiscal year and only $145 billion in fiscal year 2007. Now, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that all things being equal, this would result in an upwards movement in yield, a downward movement in price, providing negative returns absent any foreign exchange factor. But all things are not equal. For starters, the problems facing the largest competitive currency for the dollar, the euro, are perhaps even more substantial than those confronting the United States. And I want to be kind, but I will point to Spain as an example, and I won't point to Ireland because Mark Wynn, my trusted colleague, is Irish by birth. But the example of a euro area, area economy that led the European pack on the upside, I don't know if you realize, but Spain was the principal job creator in Europe for almost a decade, but is now cascading rapidly downhill. In the case of the other major reserve currency, uh, in the case of Japan, you know, you're well aware, as anybody, the economic fiscal and political predicament that they are faced with, and I don't think I need to belabor that. My point is that demand for treasuries and other official U.S. government issues will be determined by their attractiveness relative to alternatives and may well be judged, under most scenarios that I can see, as more rather than less attractive uh, than others' alternatives. Moreover, both the fate of the budget imbalances and the potential for total returns earned by investing in U.S. securities obviously depends on the efficacy of the fiscal policies that Congress has advanced as proposed by the new President of the United States.